right, well, hello everyone. Welcome to the Waukesha Public Library's presentation, Your, path, your Library Past and Future. Um, my name is Carrie Pinkner and I am the Community Engagement Manager here at the library. I am delighted to be your moderator for the presentation today with historian Dr. Ellen Lanjo and our library director, Bruce Gay. Uh, before we start, you may have heard Bruce just say that all of the attendees uh, will be muted and your video will not show during the program. Only the panelists will be highlighted. Feel free to answer or type it, excuse me, not answer, type in any questions in the Q&A box. It's either at the bottom of your screen or at the top of your screen, the drop down menu. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. I also want to let you know that this program will be recorded and it will be made available on the library's YouTube channel if you'd like to watch it later on or recommend it to one of your friends. Uh, this, the Waukesha Library um, is excited to celebrate our 125th anniversary this year along with the city of Waukesha. And this is just one of the programs designed to highlight the library's history and the impact. I'd like to tell you a little bit about our first presenter, Dr. Ellen Langell. Ellen lives in Waukesha, has a PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in American Intellectual History, and is the author of more than 20 books. One of our favorites is the one that she wrote about the history of the Waukesha Library called A Window to the World, A History of the Waukesha Public Library, 1896 through 1996. And if you're interested, there are several copies of the book available for you to check out here at the library. Ellen will speak for approximately 25 minutes about the history of the library, and then we will transition to a brief presentation by Bruce Gay, who will discuss the future of the library. We are delighted to have you here today, Ellen, and thank you again for joining us. Ellen, if you would like to begin at this time, please do. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie, and I want to thank the staff for setting this up and also thank the Friends of the Library who sponsored the original book for the centennial, and I'm glad it's still around. <laughs> um, I may intersperse a few of my favorite quotations because I am a lover of libraries, as I'm sure is not a surprise. Um, and I love this one. It says, the only thing you absolutely have to know about a new place you move is the location of the library. <laughs> um, back in 1896, when Waukesha's women's clubs were thriving, and many of them still are, um, the Ideal Club, the Practical Club, and the Beacon Lights Club uh, were groups of women who began to emphasize in this progressive era uh, the importance of reading. And one of their members, a woman named Fanny Ells, E-L-L-S, uh, was pivotal in starting a collection at her house. And um, a lot of the members contributed books. So it grew to about 600 books by 1896. And that's the date we use as the official beginning of the library because the women's clubs began to discuss turning that collection public. And so beginning in 1896, they were already lending out books, but mostly to friends, kind of informal. But they made a, a very official move to start the library. And they were well aware of, of course, the program set up by Andrew Carnegie and his foundation uh, for the building of libraries in this country and around the world. And so they filled out an application for a library building. And as it went with the Carnegie Foundation, uh, the Carnegie's Foundation would pay for the building, but the collection would belong to the municipality. So they were aware of that. And they heard in um, 1902 that they were gonna get $15,000 from the Carnegie Foundation for a 5,000 square foot building of Waukesha limestone. Um, the architect was um, actually, uh, Waukesha resident, Charles Anderson, and he had designed uh, the Nickel Building and the Union School in town, which both buildings are still there. One is on the National Register. Um, so the Waukesha Limestone was the uh, building material of choice. 
and $15,000 was forthcoming. Um, then they needed a location. Oh, okay, well that's, okay. Uh, we'll get to that slide in a minute. That's a different one than I thought we were starting with. Um, the location was gonna be in Cutler Park, which the city had just purchased from the estate of Morris Cut Cutler. Just, okay, never mind those pictures. Um, and Cutler had just died in 1896. He was the original settlement's first significant settler. And there you go, in 1834. And here's a picture, of course, with snow of the original limestone uh, building in Waukesha. Um, across the world, the Car Carnegie Foundation had funded um, about 2,500 libraries. About 1,700 of them were in the United States and 63 were in Wisconsin. So it was an incredibly um, prolific and supportive foundation. One of the stipulations of Carnegie Group was that the city had to actually officially adopt the library and put it in its budget. So the city uh, set up a new board of directors for the library and promised $1,000 a year in yearly support. There were three men and three women on the board because the women's clubs had been so pivotal. And the women's clubs continued to fundraise for the purchase of more books as time went on. They knew 600 wasn't really <laughs> enough. <laughs> and so they were still remained very influential. Initially, um, lending was available only to residents of the city of Waukesha because the city had adopted the library. And by 1915, the city had about 8,000 people um, but interesting, 68% of the Waukesha population of 8,000 was foreign barn. And uh, of that, uh, a good third were Germans, of course. Um, about 1,700 got library cards. So, you know, almost 25%. So it was very, very popular. And right away they put in the new uh, Dewey system. And you can see on this slide, the um, curvature of the very formal front desk in the old library echoed the curvature of a good part of the library building. So uh, this is an early, actually early picture of that front desk. Um, as the library developed uh, after its grand opening, it became not just a wonderful lending library, uh, but in the war years, uh, they decided Fanny L still in, in charge at age 73. Um, was uh, influential in them sending books to um, Waukesha County soldiers overseas in the war in the trenches. Uh, the library had to close for a few months in 1918 due to the Spanish flu epidemic. Sounds very familiar. Um, and then finally, Fanny Ells decided to retire. But before she did, the library installed the telephone and new typewriters. Uh, and um, Fanny Ells' salary of $35 a month. She was initially a volunteer, and then she got $35 a month. And they decided in order to hire a replacement for her, they should almost triple it to 75 a month. County residents could then, uh, after, right after World War I, use the library, but they had to pay a dollar yearly fee. So the library expanded its uh, uh, constituency considerably. And there's another wonderful picture of the facade of the library with the beautiful curvature. The actual grand opening was in 1904. Fanny Ells, of course, presided. Uh, Cutler Park by then was having band concerts. Um, the band was playing John Philip Sousa marches right outside the library door. Uh, and the collection had grown to 4,000 books uh, by the end of World War I. Most popular were The Call of the Wild by Jack London. Books about the new air age, because the Wright brothers' flight, of course, was not that old. Books about the Panama Canal, which opened in 1904. And books about the national parks and train travel west, uh, which, of course, came with a result of Teddy Roosevelt's conservation program. 65% of the collection was nonfiction, which is interesting. Um, they also decided to start a local history and local artifact collection. And the the 1880 book, which was the first book on the history of Waukesha County, became pivotal to that. And then they began to collect other artifacts and periodicals. Uh, they did decide they wanted a community meeting room and it was a $15 rental charge because the Carnegie 
bylaws wouldn't allow them to have a free meeting room. <laughs> Um, at first, children only age 10 and up were allowed to use the library, but the various clubs, particularly the Ideal Club, realized that reaching out to children with books was crucial. And so they kept um, collecting money for children's books. Most popular in these uh, early couple decades were, of course, Beatrice Potter, books by Mark Twain, Louisa May Alcott, Anne of Green Gables, the Wind in the Willows, The Wizard of Oz, Rudyard Kipling books, Robert Stevenson's Treasure Island. Uh, not a surprise, because many of those are still enduring and popular. Um, John Buckner, who was a local philanthropist who left the land for Buckner Park, also left $725 to the library for children's books upon his death. So the children's collection began to really uh, advance. So it's kind of fun that we see children at the desk. By 19, uh, early 1920, circulation had climbed to 124,000 a year. So you can see the popularity of um, this library. And other children's books were added thanks to Ideal Club, books by A.A. A. Milne, of course, Winnie the Pooh, the Mary Poppins series, Dr. Doodle books. For adults, popular in the 20s, of course, were Sinclair Lewis, Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and Thornton Wilder. And one of the reasons I use the title Window to the World is that one of the themes of my book was how libraries opened up to people a view of the world. And there's, you can see the children there. That's before there was a separate children's room. I love that picture. Um, and so the Window to the World theme is, is something that intrigued me. And throughout my book, I tried to talk about um, how the library opened up the world to uh, both adults and children. By 1938, even though the depression, of course, was a crucial condition, um, the residents of Waukesha, there were 17,000 by then, and the library was just considered way too small for all the books and all the people. Um, of the 17,000 residents of Waukesha, 8,000 had library cards. So again, you can see the popularity and need for the book, um, for the edition. So the new edition was started in 1938. Um, they used furniture from some of the closing resort hotels in Waukesha, so that made it a little more affordable. And Roosevelt's um, Works Progress Administration, the WPA New Deal workers did a lot of the work on that 1938 edition. In the 1930s, um, for adults, some of the most popular books here were books by Anne Morrow Lindbergh about, of course, Charles Lindbergh, Margaret Mitchell's book, of course, Gone with the Wind, John Steinbeck again, and um, Pearl Buck, The Good Earth. They died, decided to hire their first director who was a graduate of the University of Wisconsin Library School. Her name was Eva Landis. And she stayed for quite a while and steerhead, spearheaded the sending of atlases and books to soldiers again in World War II. There were 6,000 men from Waukesha County who served in the war and of course the student um, Army Training Corps was at Carroll University. Um, the new director of the library who replaced Landis and was there for a long time was the first male. It's a man named Edward Lynch. And his wife thought children's wing was so important. And you can see some of the windows here. I love that theme too of windows to the world. And his wife volunteered and ran the children's library when Ed, Edward Lynch was here. By the end of the war, um, there were a lot of books, nonfiction, uh, purchased by the library to circulate on vocations because there were so many returning soldiers who wanted information about jobs or job training and so forth, and because of the GI Bill. And so by the late 1940s, vocational books were very, very popular. Um, and by 1950, um, the library budget, or the early 50s, had grown to 34000 from an original $1,000 a year from the city, um, and even had grown during the Depression. So the city support was pretty steady. In the 1950s, the library added two things that were interesting, a film collection and movie nights. And the staff under Lynch grew to about seven total. They had a lot of books about the war, um, from Here to Eternity and the movie, books about Rommel, particularly the Africa Corps, 
In the 1950s, they started the bookmobile. This was the post-war baby boom. And so that was um, a very popular feature that they did to extend the reach of the library. They also bought in the 1950s three window air conditioners. So <laughs> that was very popular. <laughs> um, and in the 1950s, some of the most popular books for children, not surprising again, were Dr. Seuss books, Anton Uxbury, The Little Prince, E.B. White's books, and C.S. Lewis. So those were the ones with the greatest circulation in the children's group. In 1958, after 20 years, they decided another expansion was necessary because the collection had grown to um, over 43,000 books by then. And they also had installed new microfilm and by the 60s microfilm readers. So in 1961, the city undertook a bond issue for about 300,000 for a new, a new West Wing. It was 19,000 square feet. And when you think about that, I mean, that's huge because the original library was only 5,000 square feet and this wing alone was 19,000 square feet. That new wing opened in 1963 uh, and they decided to purchase all new shelves as the collection grew in the 50s to over 51,000 books. So you could see the growth uh, was just uh, incredible. The children's, a separate children's room had evolved again through the work of uh, Mrs. Lynch and of the Ideal Club. So they decided to segregate the children's collection into kind of a separate space in a separate room. The book budget alone had grown by 1952 to uh, over 20,000. Uh, purchases of books. You can see some children here during one of the children's reading hours, which I think that's such a cute picture. I love that one. Um, adult books during the early 1960s, not surprising, were the Theodore White Making of the President, 1960, about Kennedy, and the book Ship of Fools, uh, which was, of course, a reflection on um, Germany and the fascists. And of course, the book by Rachel Carson, Silent Spring. Those were the three most popular books. Um, the issue during the McCarthy era, and McCarthy, of course, a senator from Wisconsin, was about censorship. And the library had to face that uh, head on, as did other libraries. And our library um, had the spirit and the courage to deny some of the McCarthyist demands, which is terrific, I think. Um, and they also turned down an offer by the John Birch Club of Wisconsin uh, to do a special exhibit with adults, adult books that were all about the communist conspiracy. So I found that very interesting too. As the 60s went on, the books about civil rights and by civil rights writers became increasingly important. And we're not surprised when we think about that as the 60s. Martin Luther King's books, James Baldwin's particularly uh, books, and then also uh, a product of the time was an incredible increase in the interest in genealogy. So the library began to stock books that would help people research their family history. Another popu very popular author in the, into the 60s and 70s was Kurt Vonnegut. And of course, some of his great books were about the, the, the war. Social activism, of course, continued into the 60s and 70s. Cutler Park witnessed not just band concerts, but peace rallies, anti-Vietnam rallies. And in the 70s, Waukesha County surpassed 280,000 residents. Uh, so I guess library usage, of course, was booming. Um, the new interstate highway system that had begun under Eisenhower in the 50s blossomed. And by the 1980s, people were moving out of Milwaukee to many little settlements around the counties, around the Waukesha County. And so they set up the new federated library system with Waukesha as its core, as its anchor library. But there were 16 affiliated libraries in this new federated system in the 1980s. Um, with the window to the world expansion and the theme of window to the world, um, the library looked in uh, 1982 at a further building expansion because the usage was so heavy, the collection was growing so big. And Edward Lynch decided to retire. He had been head of the library from 1942 to 1974. And he was replaced by a woman 
that I met when I was working on the book, though she had retired, who became a legend in the city, Dorothy Naughton. And she helped steer the expansion of the library in the early 1980s. And this was to a 60,000 square foot addition. So when you go back you know, to the original space of um, 5,000, of course, this was an expansion alone. Um, they did decide, and I think it's so great they did, to keep at least part of the old limestone walls of the Carnegie building. And we can still benefit from seeing that because that they treasured that historic part of the building. And in that old um, part of the building, initially they put periodicals, later that became the local history room. And with the growth of the Waukesha County Historical Society and Museum, there was a lot of cooperation at that time. The baby boom was, um, of course, in full, full bore by the 60s and 70s. And so the children's room was also uh, enhanced and segregated off uh, at that time. The library collection in the 80s grew to 173,000 books and the circulation was about 16,000 a week. So again, you can see the popularity. By the 1990s, videos became increasingly popular and the library began to look at having shelves with um, videotapes that people could check out. They also decided to introduce a new automated checkout system. Uh, and uh, the Windows theme was still very strong. So if we can see another slide here, I'm sorry, Carrie, but there's a couple slides that show, yeah, the extension um, in the 80s into the 90s and the height, but the, the window theme is still very much there. And I think we have another slide right after this. Yeah, that shows again, the theme of the windows and the window to the world. So uh, that, I love that theme. Um, by the end of the 1980s, uh, this video space was established. They had installed computers uh, for library use and ultimately for patron use. They had established an automatic checkout uh, system. So things high tech were coming in and being welcomed and very popular. Um, because of the baby boom into the 70s, 80s, and thereafter, um, the uh, library established closer cooperation. Oh, yeah, you can see part of the addition there um, with local school libraries as the Waukesha School District began to grow. The Waukesha Library and Librarians, um, staff of seven and growing, began to work uh, collaboratively with uh, schools and the school libraries. Uh, and so that was obviously a very strong move. Um, there was a new Friends of the Library Committee established for support um, uh, in the 60s. So that became, again, a pivotal organization. When we get to more recent decades, and I'm looking at watching the time here, um, of course, juvenile books, Harry Potter and others were feverishly popular. Among adults in the uh, late 80s and 90s and into the turn of the century, were books about and by Obama, about Donald Trump and presidents. Of course, John Grisham books, Dan Brown books like the Da Vinci Code. Also a lot of self-help and wellness books became very popular nonfiction books, as did fiction books like Stephen King and James Patterson. When we look now um, in closing and time flies, <laughs> So go ahead to any other uh, slides that you have. I think there may be one or two more, Carrie, but whatever, if you have any others, it's fine. If not, that's okay. Um, yeah, let's go back to that one because I love those windows in the reading room. Um, the library established a new teen zone uh, in the early century and they put together a genealogy book camp, boot camp for people in this increasingly popular uh, field of genealogy. And of course the um, television series Roots had helped stimulate that. They also put together a bilingual program and they put together some really creative things like toy exchanges, jigsaw puzzle exchanges. The new Waukesha Reads program came in uh, where the community would all read and discuss one book. Uh, the collection had grown uh, 
in the last five years now to over 313,000. Circulation over a million, about a million 59,000 a year. And they had delivery outreach to the homebound. Uh, so all kinds of new and innovative programs marked uh, the approach of the 125th anniversary. Um, two books I've loved, and I'll end with this, that people might enjoy. Maybe you've read them. <coughs> Excuse me, they're very recent books. One is called The Paris Library, and it's about the famous American library in Paris during World War II. It's a wonderful read. And the other one, which is on the bestseller list right now, is called The Midnight Library. Uh, which is a very creative look at the importance of libraries. <coughs> and I'll turn it over to Bruce in a minute. I just want to end with one of my other favorite quotes, um, where I, one of the writers wrote, I have always imagined that paradise will be a kind of a library. So uh, thank you for having me in. I will turn it back to Carrie. Hi, everyone. I'm back. Well, thank you, Ellen, for that wonderful presentation and also for your patience with the slideshow operator. Oh, not <laughs> to worry. Apologies for that. That's okay. Not a problem. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that um, if you do have any questions for Ellen or for Bruce's upcoming presentation, please type them into the Q&A box. I see there are three of them already in the box and, and we will be answering those later after Bruce's presentation. Well, next I'd like to introduce Bruce Gay. Bruce earned his Master of Library and Information Sciences in Public Librarianship from UW-Milwaukee and has been the director of the Waukesha Public Library for three and a half years. Prior to joining the team, he was the Milwaukee County, he was with the Milwaukee County Federated Library System. Already under Bruce's leadership, we've seen some exciting changes and the library's future is bright, and Bruce is here to tell you a little bit more about that now. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Um, excuse me, I'm going to remove the spotlight from you. Thanks, everybody. I'm, thank you for attending, and thank you, Dr. Langell, for that very interesting uh, speech. I took a lot of notes myself. I do not believe that I will be <laughs> here as long as Ed Lynch. Uh, that would put me a long way in the future. Um, <laughs> I've been here now three and a half of the 125 years. Uh, my name is Bruce Gay, um, and I'm the director here. The library has a long and uh, very exciting and uh, you know, wonderful history. And one of the themes that I note from uh, Dr. Langell's speech is that the library continually responds to the needs of the community as they are at the time. So uh, for returning GIs, we, we do something for um, the women's clubs at the beginning of the library, you know, that, that's a, an important community need. Um, it's good to note that the, the Beacon Lights Club is still active and still supports the library, even after all these years. So we're really happy. And so is that. the Ideal Club, I should say. And the Ideal Club too, correct, yes. yes. <laughs> um, so we are celebrating our 125th and I'm going to first make a shameless plug. As part of our celebration, we are offering new 125th anniversary library cards and I'm going to show this and hopefully it will be visible for most people. Um, yeah. It's a 125 years Waukesha Public Library. The cafe means that this card is good at all public libraries in Waukesha and Jefferson counties and you can come in today and get your new library card for free. Uh, we have quite a few of them and we're excited to, to celebrate the library this way. Uh, they're, they're very nice. They came out really well. We were really happy with them. Okay, what I really am excited to talk about today is our upcoming renovation of the first floor of the library. Um, in 2005, the library completed a renovation that was called phase one of a renovation. Um, and at that time we were waiting for phase two, which never has really happened. We added the teen zone. Uh, we added, um, we renovated our children's library on the second floor but we really had some needs that had not been addressed just through phase one. So we're excited about that. One of the things that we did in the last couple of years, we did a strategic plan where we talked to community members in separate forums, and we also did a survey. And one of the things that came out from that was uh, people love the library, which we're very happy about, 
and also that it would be great if the library had more meeting spaces for people. That That's a growing need for libraries right now. So uh, we are excited to talk about what we're going to do with the library. And we're actually looking forward to a renovation to begin in the next couple of months. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna show you uh, some pictures. I'm gonna show you some pictures of the library as it is now. And then I'm gonna show some architects renderings of what it's going to look like so that you can get an idea of where we're going and what we're doing. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is we are not actually increasing the square footage of the library. We're not expanding outside in any way. Um, what we're doing instead is we're adapting to the changing needs of the community. So um, our nonfiction collection is very popular and very important, but there are parts of that collection that are not as popular as they used to be. And so uh, what we're doing is we're sort of rejiggering our spaces to better uh, meet the needs. So um, I am going to share my screen and it always takes me a second, excuse me. Okay. You should be seeing my screen with the picture of the lobby of the library. Um, if, if not, uh, you know, Kelly or Carrie, let me know. Perfect, great. So um, this is the lobby as it looks today of the library. Uh, I'm sure almost everyone has been in here and seen this. Uh, we have a, a great lobby. It's very filled with light. Uh, it's very grand and a tall ceiling. And then I believe you can also see my pointer. Then you go into the library proper and it's really very dark right now. There's black ceiling tile um, and it's kind of a dramatic entry, but it's also hard for people to know where they should go because it looks a little forbidding almost uh, coming in. So you can see in this picture, we have our book drop, our automated book drop, um, the security gates, uh, the circulation desk near the back there, the black ceiling tiles, and I'd like you to look particularly at this pillar, which is on the right of the screen right now. Uh, we, we're not going to be able to move any pillars, so they're good wayfinders for what's going to happen next. So from this, we're going to move to this. And you can see the same pillar is on the right. So I'll give you a second to take a look at that. Uh, you're some of the first people to see this, so this is very exciting, I hope, for you. Um, and some of the things that you'll notice in here is that the security gates are actually moved up closer to the door, which lets us make the lobby itself a functioning part of the library. So that's that kind of expands our public space without expanding the footprint of the library. On the far right, you'll see our new book section. Uh, we'll be reusing the same shelves. We're putting the new books in the lobby. So immediately once you enter the lobby, you look to the right and there will be the new books. The big changes, of course, are we've pushed the wall as part of this construction back about 15 feet. That uh, white and black thing is the book sorter. So we're shortening the conveyor belt on that and pushing it back. And what that does is it lets us open up the space a little bit more. So it's a little bit more inviting for people. Um, the ceiling, of course, we can't raise because there's all sorts of mechanical and plumbing right up in there. But what we're doing is we're going to put wood slats with lights in there so that it's brighter and more welcoming. And we're moving self checkouts up towards the front so that you can see immediately where you need to check out. Um, and you, you will be, and I don't have a picture of this, but from the lobby, you will actually be able to see all the way to the stairs leading up to the children's room. So it's going to be much more open and visible for what we're doing. Okay, now I'm going to imagine you're walking through here, and we're going to get to about over here near this pillar and turn around and looking at what our service desk is going to look like. So currently, when you stand and look back at our media collection and towards the circulation desk, you can see our circulation desk is here. Um, and we have some self checks and all of our media and our holds out here. Uh, but again, we're going to push this wall back to open that space up a little bit more. Um, I'd ask you to, you'll notice it's a door all the way to the left and it has a clock above it. That's sort of your wayfinder in this picture. Uh, what we're going to do then that's the same door. 
is push the wall back and make the desk a wraparound desk so it's more visible to everybody. And this is going to be our first floor, serve, our main service point on the first floor so that we'll have librarians and other library staff both working there. Uh, so one of the things that we're excited about is that um, right now, if you go to uh, the Librarians, they might need to send you to the circ desk, circulation desk to answer a question. And the circulation desk might also then need to send you back to the reference desk to get that question answered. So we're looking forward to having this in place where you won't have to be pinballed around like that. You'll be at one place and you know that the people there will get your question answered. Um, it's obviously much brighter, a cleaner look. Of course, it's an architecture's rendering. Um, and so you don't see any of the paper or mess that is likely to show up on here. Um, so we'll just imagine that's what it's really gonna look like because that would be more exciting like that. Okay. I did talk about meeting rooms and I wanna focus on that a little bit. Um, one of the things that we like to do is we like to compare ourselves to similar communities libraries. And uh, when we did that a couple of years ago, uh, we found out some interesting things. Um, in Appleton, which we compare ourselves to a lot, the library has four meeting rooms with a capacity for more than 260 people. Beloit also has four meeting rooms with a capacity of 282. In Janesville, they have four with capacity of 235. And Oshkosh has three with capacity for 195. Uh, we currently have two rooms with about a 110 capacity. So we're much lower than what other libraries are. And this is something that we really are, we're really excited about because um, it's been hard for us to host the kinds of events that we want to host. Uh, just as a, a kind of a silly example, um, if we have a book club that wants to meet at the library, we don't really have a good space for a book club to meet. And so more often than not, we have to say, we don't have a space for you, sorry about that. After the renovation, we should have four small conference rooms that would work perfectly for a book club. So we're excited about that. Now, this slide, basically, uh, I've just turned around from where we were before. You're looking at the media collection and you'll notice there's a door on the left side. That's the door into our current community room. So it's not really very inviting. And unless you knew what it was, you wouldn't know that there's a meeting room back there. Uh, this meeting room is can seat, I'll probably get this wrong, but about 65 people if it's very tight. Um, I'll also ask you to note the three pillars here. There's one here, one near the back, and one all the way on the right that you can just see the tornado shelter sign on. What we're going to do is this wall is going to basically move all the way out to that third pillar, and it's going to triple the size of our meeting room. So I'll show you an image of what the architect says it will look like. So you can see the three pillars. Here's that one that was in the middle, the one that was near the back, and the tornado shelter pillar. Um, so, and this entire space inside here is going to be the meeting room. Um, a really great thing that libraries are doing now, and we're gonna do this too, is making meeting rooms flexible spaces so that um, when we don't have a meeting going on and we'd like to have a place for people to sit, we can have this area just have some tables and chairs in it. And then when we have a meeting, we can easily close the long folding glass doors. And I'll show you that in a minute to close off the meeting space. For, uh, additionally, um, this meeting space is actually three different size meeting rooms. We have the one big room between these two pillars and back. That's about double what we have now. And then we have from this pillar to this pillar and back, which we can close off separately and create a meeting room of about the same size as we have currently. Or we can do one big meeting room that opens all the way up. And this track here is where the room will close. So we can pull out something to close that meeting room. Um, you can see in here that this is going to be a demonstration kitchen where people are going to be able to work and do programming in there. We have a the community engagement group is working on a lot of programs for that. We'll have video monitors so that people can see everything. We will, uh, I was interested to hear that we started doing movie nights in the 50s. We continue to do movie nights and they're very popular. Now I wanna show a picture of what this will look like once uh, the windows, the doors are closed. Um, 
it'll be all glass. They'll be shaded halfway up so that it gives some privacy, but also some light coming out. And you can see we have the two sets of walls closed and the wall inside, which will be a metal wall closed also. So it'll look like this when it's closed. Okay. Another thing a response libraries have made uh, current needs and requests for people is um, right now, a lot of libraries have added what we're calling maker spaces. And a maker space is a place where uh, the public can come in and learn how to do things. And that's really the most basic way of saying it. Uh, typically, you'll see maker spaces that will have 3D printers or um, audio recording areas, video recording areas. But it's really an idea that we will have a space dedicated in the library where people can learn how to make things using library equipment, because this is equipment that's expensive and it's good to learn how to do it and then figure out if you wanna you know, invest more into it. When we have our maker programs, which we're able to do with some robotics things and so on, they've proven to be very popular. So I'm gonna show what we're gonna do with that. If I can get that, there we go. Uh, this is currently our part of our fiction collection. Um, this is really not a very attractive picture, but I'll give you the pic idea what it is. Um, and this is right now where you see all the book carts. You can see that the wall is kind of cut out here and goes back. And this is kind of in a dark corner of the library that I think most people probably know where, I'm, where you are now. Um, what we're going to do is change this space into a maker space, which will look something like this. You can see the cutout wall where the people are able to work and some tables running through the back with video monitors. These up on top will be power supplies that can be pulled right down. And the two meeting rooms that are back here will turn into an audio recording and a video recording studio where we'll have people who know how to run this and will do classes. And so that people of all ages can learn how to do make podcasts or uh, how to do um, stop motion videos and so on. So it's, we're really excited about this. And, and I think it'll be a, a real showpiece for the library. Finally, looking at my time, oh, I'm good. Finally, uh, go back to the original Carnegie room of the library. We're really excited about this. You can see the windows that you saw in all the pictures earlier on, the curved set of windows and the one window that was above the entrance back when the library was built. Uh, currently, we use this space to house our magazine and newspaper collection, but it's really underutilized for what it is. And so we're excited about changing it to look like this and I don't think I need to tell you where that um, you know what you're looking at. I don't need to give you any landmarks because you can tell. So this will become our new local history and genealogy room. Uh, we do we will have a fireplace. Um, the wood it will be a wood cork wood floor. We'll try to put some wood around the old windows so that it looks a little bit more like a traditional library. And what'll be nice about this space is that. The um, book display units that you see and the chairs, all of this will be easily removable so that we'll be able to use this as a third big meeting space. So for something like an author event or a lecture, uh, we'll have a sound system built in here so that people can come in here and you know have a maybe a more quiet kind of talk event. Um, and that's you know that's a, we really think this is going to be a great uh, rejuvenation of the Carnegie Room. And it's really nice in a library that's this old to still have that space available. So I would love to say this is the final renovation, we'll see, but I've read the book and I know the library regularly adapts to meet community needs and I expect it to continue to. Um, I am confident that the library will continue to do that. And I expect we'll have another 125 years to come. And Carrie, I'll give it back to you if there are questions. Wonderful. Thanks, Bruce, for that wonderful presentation. And I will stop sharing now. Okay. Although it's a great screen to look at, isn't it? Well, we can put it back up if people would like. <laughs> so, and again, thank you, Ellen, for your wonderful presentation. At this time, we do have a few questions. Um, and the first one, it looks like it is for Ellen. Ellen, what is your next project? Oops, I scrolled down a little too far, but that's okay. Ellen, what is your next project? Um, well, thank you for that question. Uh, I've been so lucky in being able to do community organizations 
from legal histories to institutional histories, the library, of course, is one. Uh, and I didn't mention in my talk, but when the li our library started in 1896, Carroll University uh, was 50 years old. They were celebrating already their 50th birthday as the oldest college in Wisconsin. Um, this year, they're celebrating their 175th anniversary, and I'm writing that book for Carroll on the 175 years of hmm. Carroll University in uh, Waukesha in the Midwest. So that's a current one I'm doing. Um, and Bruce, I was happy to hear that you went to UW-Milwaukee. I taught at Carroll for about 10 years, and then um, when times got a little lean at Carroll, I was lucky to get a professorship at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and uh, helped a friend who wrote the history of UW-Milwaukee. So I've had a wonderful, uh, lucky career in writing all kinds of those histories. All right, so I had scrolled down a little bit too far. Let me go back to um, <coughs> the book uh, you originally were chatting about. What made you want to write this book? The library book? Uh, the library book, yes, thank you. Um, well, I think because I'm such a lover of libraries and also I was approached by a man named John Melster, who was at that time the head of the Friends of the Library, um, about my interest in writing it, and I was interested. And also because we had finished an updated book of um, the history of Waukesha County. It's called From Farmland to Freeways. And it still is kind of the definitive history of Waukesha County. And I was a co-editor with Jean Pent Lorkey, who was uh, the head of the Waukesha County Historical uh, Society and Museum. And then I also wrote a, a chapter in that book that was on the history of schools and education. Uh, in Waukesha County. So I think that's probably why they uh, why they turned to me. Wonderful. And then how long did it take you to write the book? Uh, it took about a year and a half uh, with research and writing and then the publication process, which for me was actually fairly quick. Some of the bigger histories I've written, uh, like 150 year history of the M&I Bank or the 150 legal year legal history of the state of Wisconsin. Uh, that was about a three, those were about three or four year uh, projects. So it, it kind of varies. Um, I've written some histories of Milwaukee's hospitals like St. Mary's, the oldest, Sinai Samaritan, um, Columbia. And those are usually two to three years, typically. Thank you. And then this also looks uh, like a question for you, Ellen. Ellen, where was the original library? Uh, really right where it is now. <laughs> um, the city was just thrilled because Morris Cutler had just died. I mean, they aren't thrilled because he died, but um, his land, he had quite a few acres from 1834 when he first came to Waukesha from Indiana. And so he had a pretty large holding in the um, city of acreage and his house was uh, further, I think, southwest. Anyway, there's a historic sign where his house was. So they decided to keep that, and that now is on the National Register. But the acreage that now is Cutler Park became available after his death, and the city wisely chose to buy that and turn it into, you know, the bandstand and a park for kids and all kinds of things, and then also locate the library there. Thank you. So um, sure. maybe another question for Ellen. Did the original okay. Carnegie or Carnegie Library have two levels? The one photo looked like the ceiling was so low. Well, compared to today, it was low. I mean, it was really a sort of single story limestone building. The limestone um, actually was what they used in a lot of the early uh, Carroll College buildings and the quarry that they got all the limestone from was, uh, if you are familiar with East Avenue, if you look down the hill from where Carol is on the hill, because it was called College Hill, right down the hill was a valley, uh, which is still there, but it's no longer a quarry. And that was the limestone quarry uh, that most of the buildings at the Carroll College were built from. And of course our Carnegie Library too. Um, 
and it, it was a solid structure, obviously neoclassical, but not in height. The height idea came later and all the windows. The original Carnegie Library wasn't big on windows, <laughs> although it was very welcoming, but um, the window features came later. And I'm glad they did. They're beautiful, aren't they? Mm -hmm. They sure are. Uh, Bruce, this one is for you. What is your favorite part about being the director at the Waukesha Public Library? Mm, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think my favorite part is that um, I'm excited about the library finding out and responding to community needs. I think we made a great start with that and I'm looking forward to how this new renovation makes us even more dynamic. And I, I you know, I'm lucky we have a really excellent staff and um, it's, it's kind of just a bright future. So that's, that's exciting for me. Thank you. Um, it looks like this one is also for you, for you, Bruce. Um, it sounds like funding for the library was pretty good at the beginning. Is that still the case? We, we could always use more, <laughs> <laughs> but really uh, we are very well supported by the city. Um, uh, because of the system that uh, Ellen talked about a little bit, uh, the, what was it that initially the Waukesha County Federal Library System and now is the Bridges Library System and state laws, Wisconsin um, has really been very thoughtful about setting up uh, libraries so that uh, people around the community both have access to the libraries and help support it. So uh, we, we get money from Waukesha County, we get a good uh, we have a good budget from the city of Waukesha and we get we get reimbursed from Jefferson, Dodge um, and other counties in the area as people use us. So it's it's really quite an elaborate, but very thoughtful, well-made system. Great, thank you. Um, I don't know if you want to expand upon this a little bit, Bruce. What are what are you most excited about regarding uh, the redesign? Um, you know, it, it varies from day to day. I'm I'm very excited to see what that Carnegie room looks like. I think that's going to be a, just a, a great place for people to gather. And you know, I I think there'll be just you know knitting clubs and little groups and students studying. I, I think that's going to be really exciting. Um, I I'm, I'm sure the maker space will be exciting for people. And I guess I'm most excited because we're going to have opportunities for people to come in here and use us in ways that they haven't been able to before because we ha we hadn't had in the last you know 10 15 years really the capacity but we're going to have a lot more capacity and it's going to be exciting if i could just add to that i love the idea of the fireplace in there yeah. and i know that wasn't originally part of the waukesha plan but i visited you know as we travel around the state i visited some other carnegie libraries in various cities large and small and one of my favorite, besides Waukesha, is up in the city of Oconto. And that library was similar to Waukesha's in design, little taller ceilings, but it also had a fireplace in each of the wings, the west and the east wing. Mm. And they still have those. And it's just such a warm and welcoming part of the atmosphere. So I'm glad that we're doing that. Yeah, we're excited about that. Maybe Ellen, you could answer this one. What about the Indian Mounds at, in Cutler Park? Oh yeah, that's a great question. I didn't mean to, to skip over that. Um, when I taught at Carroll, you know, you would go down to Cutler Park and, and look at the mounds. Um, and of course the discovery of those goes back to um, a gentleman from Milwaukee uh, named Increase Lapham, after whom Lapham Peak is named in the county. And um, he was very much a, a scholar of not just research and books and weather and everything else, but of um, Native American history. And so he did a great job going around the area and ultimately around the state in finding these effigy uh, mounds. Uh, the big question at the time was, are they really burial mounds? Or are they just effigy symbolic mounds? And the answer was a little bit of both. Um, but he was such a contributor to our knowledge of the heritage and the mounds were uh, preserved. 
for a number of years, I was on a board in Madison called the Historic Preservation Board. And our main job was to put buildings on the National Historic Register. However, any building or any new project that might intrude upon Indian artifacts or mounds uh, always got turned down because they were considered destructive of our heritage. Thank you. Well, it looks like we have a few more questions here. Um, Bruce, how will the renovation period affect the patrons? What will be closed and what will remain open? That's a great question. Um, we're still, uh, we're, we'll be working with a contractor who the bids are due today to determine a timeline. We will not be closed for any length of period because of the construction. That's part of what's happening. So we will all we will continue to have our services available. Obviously, uh, the teen area, the second floor children's space, and most of the nonfiction area will be unaffected, and so will be open throughout. Um, but there might be a, a time where we have to find a different entrance as we're repairing and redoing the lobby. Uh, th there will be certainly the community room will not be available during when that's being worked on. So uh, we don't know for sure yet, but we will be open throughout. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned a 3D printer in the makerspace. What other activities will happen in there? Well, we will have an audio uh, recording studio, a video recording studio. Um, I know, you know, we have a makerspace manager who is working on a program for that, and it will include um, robotics work. Uh, there will also be a, a lot of libraries have done really all technology makerspace, and we're looking at also having more of an art and craft component just because um, the arts programs for kids in Waukesha have been so successful over the year that there's really a nice need for that, and I think we could fit that area really well. So some of that's still to be determined, but uh, we'll have more of an art focus, I think, than some libraries do. Um, there's a question then about, uh, will you change out or remove those empty false window structures <laughs> <laughs> on the outside of the building? It looks unfinished. Yes, it does. Uh, that's not part of this project. Um, but certainly it's something that we want to do. We want to fix that so it looks better than what it does right now. Um, but I don't have a timeline for that, but that's, that'll be kind of next step. We want to make the building as functional as possible and then we'll work on how it looks a little bit more. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you again, uh, Bruce and Ellen for your wonderful presentations and for sharing a little bit of history and a little bit about the future of the library. Um, I'd also like to invite our attendees to uh, check out our website uh, for more information on upcoming program. Uh, we do have some exciting book discussions and uh, film club discussion uh, coming up. Uh, we also have uh, a Dia de los Niños celebration that will be held in Cutler Park, one of our first uh, in-person events, of course, with safety measures in place. Uh, this is a bilingual celebration that we will co-host with the Hispanic Collaborative Network, um, and it connects families to diverse stories and honors cultural heritage. And this event is also part of the city's 125th celebration. It's on May 1st from, again, 10 to 12 in Cutler Park. So um, thank you again, everyone, and we look forward to... Uh, seeing you in the library at some time. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye now. Thanks, Thanks for coming, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.